Thank you. Roll call, Christian. Bastion. Present. Clark. Here. Fish. Here. Hausman. Here. Parsons. Present. Wakefield. Here. Mayor Lumberg. Yes. Okay, with that, we'll need an approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions from that? Hey, we have a couple questions on the supplement to the agenda. There's some dates wrong. Okay. So, number two, safety conference. Wednesday is actually November 7th, not the 8th. So, I didn't know which one. And then for number three, the Water Development Committee, Wednesday is actually the 7th. Thursday is the 13th. That's the 13th? That's all I had. Yeah, and then a work session for 11-8, code of conduct, mayor duties is not on that supplement to agenda. No, we'll, move, we'll move, need to move that to the 15th. This is gone, or unavailable on the Okay, any other additions or deletions? I will be requesting an executive session for personnel. Okay. Motion to approve, please. I'd like a motion to approve with those changes. Second. Motion to, and a second to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the approval of the minutes of October 11th, 15th, and 29th. Need a motion to approve I'll those. Motion, to approve. Second. motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The bills and claims are presented to you in the in the packet. Uh, any questions? Any of those? If not, second. I'd take a motion. <laughs> and a second. Been a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, community input and timed items. Uh, who wants to go first? Yes, sir. I am Terry Soule from 1700 South Parkview Boulevard in Brandon. I've been here 25 years. Uh, I want to speak about uh, fireworks restrictions. I have five items, uh, one of which is overarching over all of them, but uh, I'll briefly mention the first four. Uh, the first is the noise. Um, in our neighborhood, what, has be, what is supposed to be a three-day event has turned into a week-long event where uh, last year on the 6th and the 7th, Friday and Saturday, we had fireworks and mortars being shot off um, for two hours without any repercussions. Um, mortars being shot across the street that make our windows shake. Uh, pets, we have a couple of Cocker Spaniels, uh, Oscar and Felix, if you're old enough to know what, what those names mean. Uh, they will not go down, they will not go outside during the 4th of July. I literally have to carry them out after midnight because they are scared to death of the noise. Uh, vets, I worry about vets who have PTSD and hear these mortars going off. Uh, the mess, uh, Brett can attest to this. I live across the street from Brett. Uh, when we first moved there 12 years ago, the first year we shot bottle rockets and he probably had to clean up my mess. So. And regarding the mess, uh, the mess is indica indicative of the main issue for me, which is the safety issue. Uh, the mess exists because those mortars travel a long distance. And so I'm a scientist. I work at USGS Eros. So I did some analysis. Um, so if you look at the science of mortar shells and the explosives, um, the industry standard says distance should be 70 feet for every inch of shell. So if you look at the typical mortars that are shot, typical mortar is 1.75 inches. So the distance that you should be away from buildings, structures, et cetera, should be at least 125 feet. Um, Class C mortars, uh, when they leave a tube, they go about 75 miles per hour. 
Uh, they strike with the force of a pitched baseball. Uh, they leave with a fiery flame about 1,000 degrees. Uh, the diameter of the shell burst is related to the size of the shell. The 1.75 inch shell will have a burst of about 75 to 100 feet in diameter. Um, and, and because of that, th these aren't just hypothetical numbers. Because of these numbers, the fireworks industry themselves recommends 70 feet per inch of mortar shell. It's not hypothetical. Pennsylvania just liberalized fireworks in their state. And one thing that they did was make it illegal to shoot off fireworks within 150 feet of any structure, person, or car. Um, city of or Minnesota, they have a recommendation of at least 200 feet from any structure, building, or car. Uh, firework manufacturers, depending on which one it is on that sheet, it's anywhere from 150 feet to 300 feet, 100 yards. Typical lot size. Our lots on, on Parkview are 90 feet by 140 feet. There literally is nowhere safe in Brandon, and that's what this map is for. So my wife works at the city of Sioux Falls. She's a GIS mapping manager. Uh, these are actual parcel boundaries. I don't have it for Brandon, otherwise I would have done it for Brandon. These are actual parcel boundary or building structures in Sioux Falls. Um, I took that in my GIS, GIS software, done a 150-foot buffer. The red are the areas that are by the own fireworks it, the fireworks industry's own recommendations, those areas in red are unsuitable for 1.75 inch mortars. That's about 90% or 95% of Sioux Falls, which would be unsuitable for mortars unless you're in the airport or a big park or something. Okay, so what do those things do? Uh, damage. The last year that stats were available, National Fire Prevention Association. They recorded 17,800 fires caused by fireworks in 2011. 1,200 structures were burned down, 400 vehicles, $32 million in damage. Uh, just examples, Orland Park, Illinois, a regular consumer available mortar, 1.75 inch shell. Uh, somebody's house caught on fire and was totaled. They investigated, the shell was shot from a house six houses down, 500 feet away. So 500 feet away, a mortar shell can burn down somebody's house. Uh, Kirby, Texas, uh, bottle rocket, shoots, hits uh, external furniture, catches on fire, totals the house. Uh, Sykeston, Missouri, uh, there was a Lowe's that was set on fire by, far, by falling mortar fragments. Graham, Washington, a tipped mortar, the shell hit the side of the neighbor's house, totaled. Fireworks injuries, 2008, about 7,800 fireworks injuries. Since 2008, several states have liberalized fireworks as an effort to try to bring up tax revenues. Uh, because of that, injuries are now up to about 12,000 a year. Uh, last year, there was 13,000 injuries and seven deaths. 2011, there were 11 deaths. 95% of all injuries are due to this on the table, what are, are legal fireworks. Uh, Washington State uh, Hospital did a study over a 10-year period. Uh, they had 294 people that came and visited um, of the, because of fireworks injury. 40% of those were due from aerials, so things like mortar shells. Uh, of those 294, almost one-fourth had amputations. Uh, 20 people lost their vision permanently. Sir, I'm going to have to cut you a little shorter. We, we have a five-minute limitation, so if you could quickly just... Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, uh, University of North Carolina, uh, same thing. Bystand, what they found was that it doesn't matter if you're the shooter or you're a bystander. It's about 50-50. Bystanders are just as likely to be injured as the person actually shooting. Um, just a few examples. Um, 2015, 11 deaths. Nine of them were from mortar shells. Uh, two were from <laughs> illegal fireworks. Um, a man in Clintonville, I, I heard this from my dad, uh, my neighbor uh, down in Nebraska takes, uh, my dad's neighbor, he takes um, sparklers, ties them together, puts them in a tube and lights them. It's supposed to make a fiery sh shower. Uh, Kentucky, last year, a uh, man tried that, uh, the metal tube exploded, the four-year-old four daughter was killed by flying shrapnel. Um, legal mortar strikes, the force can kill. Uh, at that speed, there are admittedly stupid people that are drunk and have tried putting a mortar on their heads. It's exploded. The force of the blast has enough concussive force to stop your heart, to give you concussion, and to immediately kill you. 
uh, amputations just last year uh, in Lincoln. A, a girl had her hand blown off and had four fingers amputated. I'm eye sorry, damage. I'm sorry, sorry. I got it. Okay, gotta nope, that's you. it. I am done. Uh, so I am people. strongly. And I think you have all your information. Uh, yeah, yep, there's, delineated there's a handout, so very good. Fireworks issue, let's stay on that. Uh, other people that would like to speak to that issue. Mr. Cameron. TJ Cameron, uh, 2417 East Lopez Lane, owner of Brandon Fireworks. Um, so I set up this display for some educational purposes for the council and to ask questions later during the agenda item if you have any questions. Um, but I want to make a few personal comments first and then I have a couple of things to talk about here. Uh, I, know, <clears throat> I know a few council people cited personal reasons um, that they would support a ban at the last meeting and I respect that but I want to remind everybody that you're here to vote for the majority of Brandon. Um, Chief Cole himself said Sioux Falls ordinance chief of police was on on the news time after time again if you looked over on the 4th of July and the 3rd of July it was quite a display going up despite the ban extra officers on patrol and yet no citations were issued we wrote 17 here I'm getting it getting at is that if you put a ban in fireworks they're going to go off it's difficult to enforce it's not going to totally solve the problem um, so there has been some public input uh, being collected outside of the chambers here and um, there's been several Facebook polls one um, Dana did do a Facebook poll but it was removed because there were some inappropriate comments being made in the thread so don't have the results of that one but I myself posted a poll on August 10th had 117 votes um, 69 or 59 percent of the people voted for allow all fireworks B was restrict artillery mortar individual tube style fireworks um, but still allow cakes and display style stuff that was 32 votes or 27.5 percent only novelty such as snakes smoke balls sparklers etc was 12 votes which was 10 percent no fireworks at all was four votes at 3.5 um, Tim Wakefield jr. also posted a post on October 24th it was 300 votes so I'd say fairly significant that that's more than most of the polls have gotten in our political appointments that have happened lately um, same as <clears throat> same as last year rules was 231 votes or 77 percent only on the fourth with the same fireworks as last year was another 13 percent at 40 votes more restrictive like Sioux Falls was 29 out of those 300 votes 10 percent the Brandon Valley Journal also posted a poll same questions as Tim 14 votes 10 were for leaving it same as last year um, B only on the fourth was two and restrict was C at two also although I don't intend to discuss my overall financial statistics of my privately owned fireworks store I will share this I have thousands of customers and residents in Brandon it's actually several thousand that purchase fireworks from me each year in fact the number of Brandon residents that purchased fireworks from me last year far exceeds the number of residents that voted in our last few multiple or municipal elections combined so it's a big topic um, you're about to vote on the future how many thousands of our residents are allowed to celebrate the holiday and many of them which tell me it's their favorite holiday each year almost a pound of fireworks is lit off in the United States for every single man woman and child that lives here speaking of holidays um, it's important to note that Christmas trees on average account for six deaths or 14.8 million dollars in property damage every year in the US according to the National Fireworks um, Protection Association some additional stats the the deaths that Dana quoted were accurate eight that I could come up with by the CPSC last year two of which were made from homemade devices uh, five of which were reloadable shells like artillery and mortars like Terry was speaking about and one was using firecrackers inside of a house so um, moving on uh, let's see uh, top three injury fireworks are sparklers accounted for the largest percentage at 14 percent sparklers will be probably legal regardless of what we vote on that's 14 percent of the injuries they burn at 2,000 degrees uh, reloadable shells accounted for the next highest which was 12 percent that's what you see here on this end of this table here and that he was also referring to which are 1.75 and they also have three inch shells that are now legal in the US so multiply his distance accordingly that's the red shells you see sitting on the table uh, 10 per, or aside, aside from Christmas trees a couple other stats I know I'm at about four minutes here and hopefully you'll give me just a couple minutes to walk you through the table but if not I understand aside from Christmas trees cigarettes smoking 480,000 deaths that's 40,000 a month according to the CDC bicycles 467,000 injuries 39,000 a month a thousand deaths that's 83 deaths a month according to the 2015 CDC stats motorcycles 5,286 deaths in 2016 that's 440 a month high school football 
Um, hopefully we won't vote to ban high school football. Estimated 2 million injuries, 166,666 a month, or if you divide that into a five-month season, that's 400,000 injuries a month, um, of which 500,000 of those 2 million require a doctor's visit, 30,000 30, um, require hospitalization, and depending on the source, there's anywhere from 8 to 16 deaths. I found multiple sources and couldn't nail it down to a specific statistic, but those were the ranges I found online. 47 states, including the District of Columbia, allow some type of fireworks, according to the American Pyrotech Association, 25, which allow consumer fireworks all year long. And since 2000, 15 states have legalized fireworks, including Iowa in 2017. I hope this clears up some of the misconcessions and uh, injuries relative to other activities that we participate in as Americans. Would you give me a moment to walk you through the table? I know I'm at my five minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so what I brought was, here... Just a second. Yes, sir. It was, it was requested of uh, Councilman Member Barb Fish to have a display of uh, the fireworks, so I'm allowing some leeway here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was my personal opinion that I wanted to share, and this is more for request. So what I brought here, um, and I'm going to step away from the mic in a minute and speak pretty loud, but I'm just going to walk you through quickly. On the very end of the table are, are items, except for in each section, there's three exceptions that wouldn't be allowed under our... Um, proposed compromise ordinance. But on the end are sparklers, snaps, tanks, um, cars, things like that, and those are where allowed under Sioux Falls ordinance. In the middle, next to the board, kind of on that other table, is what I would suggest in our compromise ordinance that we still allow the residents of Brandon to participate in. And in this table over here is everything that's, not everything, but multiple examples of things that are deemed as rockets, including a lantern, and um, mortar shells, which are the single reloadable artillery shells, um, also the ones that accounted for uh, five of the eight deaths. And that also I think Terry was speaking the most against. I heard him multiple times recommend um, artillery. So I'll step away and just speak a little louder, but there's a couple examples over here I want to point out. So uh, when you look at this side, it's a lot of ground things, but there's a lot of question with uh, the Sioux Falls ordinance. So for instance, this in many many cities would be considered a ground item, but it does have something that's a projectile. So you may or may not be cited for it in Sioux Falls because it does shoot something that spins into a projectile. So I'm just pointing out some of the areas that are a little bit gray where I think if we did a compromise ordinance, it might be a little more clear. Um, smoke balls, snaps, I think everyone's pretty, pretty under, or understands those pretty good. But then there's the question of these two items. They're both snaps. Um, Sioux Falls ordinance allows snaps, uh, but this is a snap as loud as a firecracker but this is a snap that's not, a, not as loud as a firecracker. These are the ones that most people are accustomed to, but this is also a snap. You don't light it, you just throw it at the ground. Um, another item, since it says in the Sioux Falls Ordinance of Rapport, this is an item you don't even light. You just literally pinch the bag and it's vinegar and baking soda inside and you shake it and throw it and it makes a pop, so it's technically a report. May or may not be allowed under Sioux Falls Ordinance. Um, fountains, this is one of the items that I was gonna do a demo of how easy they are to point out, but this would move to this table, not allowed. Um, another item that would typically, I'm not a lawyer, but that I would interpret would be permitted would be fountains because it's not a projectile, it stays attached to the ground, shoots showers of sparks. However, this is also a fountain, uh, but this fountain has a rapport, so it has bang and it crackles. So a little bit of gray area of whether it would or would not be permitted. Same here, two fountains look almost identical. One, one bangs, one doesn't, so would or wouldn't be permitted. Um, just, I'm just kind of calling out a couple of the gray areas. Then tanks and things that people are familiar with, sparklers. Um, when you move over here, the difference that would really separate us from Sioux Falls under um, a proposed compromise ordinance is that we would still allow some aerial items. So the big difference would be, um, again, this is another one that move over here. I was going to have somebody pick them out on their own because they're very easily identifiable. Anything with a stick, very easily identifiable. Um, parachutes, which do go up in the air. Kids love to chase these. There are parachutes that don't have flaming balls, so that could be part of the ordinance, uh, you know, depending on how it, council interprets it. These are aerial display fireworks here, so they do go up in the air and they do make a bang into color. The difference with these and artillery shells, first of all, some of these can be very loud for sure, but artillery shells are the single loudest and the highest projected fireworks that they make um, legally for consumers. These. The problem with artillery shells is many people light two or three artillery shells at one time. They line them up, one can tip over another, can tip over another, and I have stood at the podium and personally said, even though this counts for 30% of my sales, that I would support a ban on these items over here because of the safety issue and the distance suggestions that Terry pointed out earlier. These are intended to allow a family display, but they're also intended to allow you to shoot more than one at a time. So 
if you light it once, they go up and they do break into the color one after another after another. However, they're manufactured to, uh, you know, be intended for that purpose. They're separated, they're, they're glued together. I mean, yes, things happen, but they're intended to be let off where you do one after another. The problem with artillery shells is every large box of artillery shells like this comes with four tubes. People think that's so you can light four at once. It's not. It's because you're not supposed to light more than six in an individual tube or the tube weakens. But instead, people do light four of these off at once and the, the velocity of one bursting can actually tip over the next tube. So that's why I had even suggested this might not be safer in town. These are intended to be lit and manufactured in that manner versus those. Um, then when you move over here, in the proposed compromise ordinance, it would be anything that is in a single tube, very easily identifiable, single tube, reloadable. I think that, you know, this, there's not anything that looks like this on the table over there anymore now that I removed the items that didn't belong, and you reload them one at a time. There is a problem, sometimes have people have put these in upside down, they're not, they do say top, bottom, but there's, could be confusion. They're not intended to just light one time, like a family display firework, and still be relatively safe. You have to exercise extra caution for your neighbors and yourself. Um, the other thing would be anything with a stick that is a rocket projectile. I know um, Ms. Lunda is out in the audience, and I know she brought us one of these from her roof. And uh, these also have a tendency to tip over. People tip them out of a, you know, a bottle or something like that. And including small bottle rockets, which would also have a stick, but I think they're very easily identifiable compared to what's on that table. They may look a little like a sparkler, but I'm pretty sure that our officers are more than confident to be able to, you know, differentiate the difference between a single tube and a stick item. Plus, these are the loudest, and these are in the top three most dangerous. These, in my opinion, are one of the most dangerous items because of the way that they can project tipping over. Whether or not they cause the most injuries, I think they're less predictable um, than the cake style fireworks. Any questions by the council on uh, items that are displayed here? Besides the fact that's really confusing, <laughs> I was going, what? I'm sorry, I was talking really fast, because I know you gave me a little extra time already. Uh, on the multiple, um, I forget what you call them, cakes or mm -hmm. whatever the name is, what is the typical size of that um, shell? So talking, when you talk yeah. about one inch for 70 feet, what, what would the typical size be or well, maximum size maybe? I don't maybe? know the exact um, inch specification. Like these are a three inch shell, these here would be a five inch shell, these were the 175s that Terry was talking about. So I don't know the exact individual, uh, but I know that these hold about 75 to 80 grams of powder per shell. These are somewhere around 30 to 45. Those can have anywhere from nine shots, it's usually the smallest one, up to 55 shots. And size and distance wise, I mean, what I can tell you from experience is these go, to Terry's point, 100, 150 feet in the air, plus this one, which he didn't even mention, has a 150 foot diameter break. Um, those only go, you know, about 50, 20, 50 feet on the high end, 20 to 25 feet on the low end, and you know, the I'm not sure what the diameter is, but I know these because they advertise it a lot. But it's probably a third of what an artillery show is. So, uh, TJ, just to put it in the synopsis, this whole area, which we now allow we in our ordinance. Allow we currently allow this in our ordinance, so this was okay last year. We're going to get rid of all of that. And I think we're all in agreement that that is really dangerous. Way at the other end is what Sioux Falls does. And our concept was to add in a few of those cake things in the middle so that a family could have a display on the 4th of July. Yep, yeah, so this is Sioux Falls here. And these were the items that we discussed and put in okay. a potential compromise ordinance that still allows a family display but reduces the risk and garbage and other things. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Any other people from the uh, audience that would like to address the fireworks issue? If you have any other questions later, I'll be here. TJ, is this yours? Well, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Adam Clark, 417 East Switchgrass Trail. Um, good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to visit a little bit about the fireworks as well. Um, I did hand this out because this is uh, 
This is a photo that was uh, taken in, our, in a neighborhood, our neighborhood, <coughs> on July the 5th. Okay, like uh, Mr. Saul mentioned, um, there's concern for for the debris, and obviously that shows that there. Um, this may seem like a little or a lot of de debris to you, and it does to me, and it's in our city streets. I'd like to point out um, that this is just the debris from lighting, lighting the fireworks. We don't know where the rest of the debris went when it goes aerial. Okay. Um, whose house did these come? Uh, whose house did they come in contact with? Okay. Once they once they're projected, we don't know where they're going to go. That's a concern. Certainly, it's not straight up and straight down. In addition, the debris pile that was, um, in addition to the debris pile, there was more ground debris all over the neighborhood. I was personally out with a five gallon bucket picking up large pieces of debris and glass from the 4th of July the day before. Um, that reason alone, I believe the debris, that it's uncontrollable and unfair to others in the neighborhood to allow the fireworks. Risk, okay. The risk of the risk of fireworks. That's risk is something I deal on a daily basis. Risk is both a noun and a verb. It's the most simplistic meaning. It refers to the possibility of loss or injury. Some risks are out of control, like that of a tornado. We can't control that. But there are other risks, such as fireworks, we can control as city leaders. This is an unnecessary risk for our citizens' safety and their property. In my line of work, I discuss risk every day. Risk is one of those things that you don't want hindsight vision on. You folks are up there, don't want to have a parent standing here next July pointing to their four-year-old son or daughter that's been blinded by fireworks and telling you this really didn't need to happen. You could have done something about it. You folks are up there don't want to have a citizen standing next July telling you that their house burned down. So it didn't need to happen. This is risk. We can control this part of the risk. You have a choice in front of you regarding this fireworks today for the citizens of Brandon. You, our city leaders, are on the right track with an ordinance, ordinance mirroring Sioux Falls. In many, it may be not the popular option, but you may have an, but you may have an, but you have an obligation to do the safe option. I commend you for doing the right thing and encourage you to stay on track, regardless of the popular vote. Keep in mind the popular vote also would like to have taxes go down and increase speed in our town. The popular answer is not synonymous with right. <laughs> okay. You know, so thank you. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Ooh, sit on my leg. Uh, up. <laughs> Hi, Kim Serwick, 812 South Nicholas Avenue. Just wanted to kind of put in my two cents. Um, TJ, great job of explaining this, that stuff because it is very confusing. Um, the thing that I just wanted to say is in the past, um, I'm not going to give concrete examples, but the council has been, um, I have seen them go from being very liberal to very conservative in the drop of a hat. I'm saying after watching what TJ exclaimed, getting rid of this chunk of stuff, I think is a great step. I think um, the other piece of it being um, able to, okay, so the police can actually tell the difference. I think TJ explained um, a lot of that stuff that would be in that gray area, that if you did allow it, it would, it would make it a lot easier for the police department to um, be able to tell the difference between those that are legal and those are not. So I think the compromise option is a great one. It's a great step um, for Brandon. Other persons from the audience that would like to speak? 
My name is Jim Irby, 905 Maywood Street, <clears throat> and I'm sorry I have a little cold coming on, I think. Um, if I had known we were doing show and tell, I would have brought my little uh, puppy mill rescue Boston Terrier that spent four months trying to get over 4th of July last year. And if you come after my Christmas tree, you're going to have to pry it out of my cold dead hand. I also want to emphasize that I have absolutely no financial interest in fireworks. I have no political interest in fireworks. I'm motivated by public safety and the right of everyone in this community to celebrate their way as long as their way doesn't force me in the privacy of my own home to celebrate it the same way. I think I have the right, when I'm in my own home, to peace and quiet. Our city was incorporated in 19, uh, excuse me, in 1973, and we had 1,900 residents. In 45 years, we've gone to almost 10,000, and we've gone to the fastest growing city in the state. And that means that over those 45 years, we've had to look at some things and pass some common sense laws. In 1973, I could walk out my front yard and fire a gun anytime I wanted to, and that was my right. But as soon as my right started putting your safety at risk, we passed a law. And that law said I couldn't do that anymore. In 1973, I could keep all the livestock, animals in my backyard that I wanted to. But as soon as my right to do that started infringing on your rights, we passed a law and that became illegal, a common sense law. In 1973, I could burn anything I wanted on my property, anytime I wanted. And then common sense dictated that my right to do that was putting your property and your life at risk. So we passed a law that said we couldn't do that anymore. But in 1973, and probably even back in 1878, when we had our first post office in Brandon, I couldn't speed because everybody knows you don't speed in Brandon. Since 1973, we've passed all kinds of laws limiting certain activities, including littering. And this one I want to read verbatim because I think it's very important. We passed a law prohibiting actions that annoy, injure, or endanger the comfort, repose, health, or safety of others, or in any way render other persons insecure in their life and the use of their property, and which affect an entire neighborhood the community, or a considerable number of persons. And that's Ordinance 722. It's called Public Nuisance. We have two other ordinances, 751 and 752, that specifically define loud or unreasonable noises as disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. My point here is that population growth and housing density have frequently dictated things that were once great and fine and appropriate to become illegal because they're now unsafe and they have consequences for the rest of the community. And I don't know, I'm not going to speak for Chief Cole, but I would hate to be a police officer out in the dark responding to all kinds of ordinances, of uh, complaints, and try to figure out which of everything on these two tables I'm looking at. So I believe the time's come now to get to that same crossroads with fireworks legislation. I believe we've arrived at the point where the safety of the community and the quality of life in the community demand that we join countless cities across the U.S., Terry mentioned, 22 states, the District of Columbia, and Sioux Falls in a common sense ordinance that limits fireworks to non-aerial, non-explosive devices. It does not limit all fireworks. 
In my opinion, the council's responsibility here, as someone else pointed out, is to pass legislation that's in the best interest of the community, not in what the public thinks is the most popular thing. I think that's why you guys are elected, to do what's right, not do what's popular. And I've got one final statement that kind of has already been made tonight. Are you willing to face a parent next year with a severely injured child or someone who's lost their home and say you had the opportunity to prevent it and you simply chose not to? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. As evidenced by all the people speaking, it's a very passionate issue on both sides of the, the aisle. We will be taking the, the issue up rather shortly in the agenda, so I guess just stay in the audience and we'll be taking it up here pretty quickly. Uh, going on to water conservation. I have asked for any other public comments. Thank you. Water conservation. Trudy Pack, 1609 South Dolly Drive. I am uh, here representing the Conservation Committee. We would like to propose the purchase of 145, approximately 145 water smarter conservation yard signs to promote our water conservation efforts. The size of the sign that we're proposing is this sign. Do not throw anything at that, please. <laughs> <laughs> and that is 18 by 24. And we did get a bid from Performance Plus on this. They will cost $9.04 each. And if we do purchase the 145 signs, that's approximately $1,300. And that's going to depend on the remaining 2018 budget. And I'll check with Christina to make sure what that is before we actually uh, put the order in. The, the thought behind having these signs is that it's going to generate conversation and education. It's going to promote awareness. It's going to, people will start asking questions. Ultimately, it's going to create a positive buzz in the community. You might recall the sign that was placed in the, in the lawn of Taco John's last year. And it read, please forgive our lawn. We are conserving water. And that sign did generate quite a bit of buzz. Um, our signs are going to be a little different. Water Smarter logo. Initially, our conservation committee will assume responsibility for. Everyone see that? <laughs> our committee will uh, assume the responsibility for distribution of the signs, and we're thinking that those signs will be going initially to our friends, our relatives, our neighbors who live in Brandon. And the leftover signs, obviously, we aren't going to get rid of that many all in one year, but they're, they can be distributed year after year. This is an ongoing initiative that we think is important. And we're hoping to gain your approval tonight for that. Can I have a sign in my yard, 1705 Parkview Boulevard? Yes. Any questions if we can order them. <laughs> so I, I guess I have uh, two questions. Um, number one, would that price include the metal stand? It's the whole okay. sign, yes. It's this. And then uh, I did not have to purchase signs this year for election, but there's a couple people that did. Uh, gut check on how much they cost, I guess. Our TJ, you bought signs. What what did you pay per sign, do you remember? I mean, I got one from, perform from Performance Press. Okay. You paid 350 Yeah, but I had to order a certain quantity. <coughs> I bought signs, not the price. Yeah, I was going to say thirteen hundred seemed high. That's kind of where my mm -hmm. thought is: is it seems kind of high priced? Because I looked into it, and then I don't think it was nine bucks a sign. Seems like it's. Higher. Did you order out of Brandon or somewhere else? I, 
I didn't order any, but oh. I, I looked at different choices, and I don't mind keeping it local, but three times the price is kind of beyond that, keeping it local. Okay. So and I just, I mean, I'm not trying to steal business sure. from Brandon, but we have to be smart with the taxpayer money, and that's a lot of premium for local. Agreed, and we haven't gone anywhere else. We've just gone to Performance Press. Right. We can certainly look around, I but we want to keep it I think the topic at hand local. right now is the, the concept of the sign, right. okay. uh, if we can. Council have any opposition to the to the concept of this? It's a very concept. Good idea. Yes, very good. Uh, probably check into that. Then uh, you can seek another quote or whatever. But uh, I've ordered those a lot, and those metal pieces are very expensive. Uh, part of that whole thing. So I think when you get down to it and actually look at the pricing, it'll be very similar. Okay. But uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, Brian, is that within, how many were you going to buy again? I, I'm sorry. Well, um, with what I think is our remaining budget, we have enough for 145. 145? Right. At that price, at that $9 price. You have any object in, objection on the budget line item? And that will use up our 2018 budget. And that's another goal of ours is to use it now and be able to use it years forward. You could really work for the federal government. <laughs> Maybe you do, I don't know. Uh, I understand. Okay. I understand. But this Trudy is something I'd get behind besides little magnets and coloring books. <laughs> this I understand, the other I don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> for once, I, I forget it. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. Progress. There's small progress along the way. Okay, we'll go ahead and, do we need a motion or anything, Brian? Or? No, it's not business. No. Conservation Committee, as long as they come in with some quotes, we'll take a look at them. Very good. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the golf course has a proposed rate for 2019 in your packet tonight. Brian, you want to quickly go through those? Sure. You've got a copy of Resolution 2118. I gave you a new one tonight because uh, Zane caught a, a slight discrepancy on the 18-hole golf cart rental that we corrected. Um, in this resolution, we clarify anybody that's 20 years of age or younger as a youth, and we're not planning on charging youth um, anything to golf. There are some restrictions on playtime Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Thursdays uh, before noon after three on weekends and holidays when they, could, when they could play. But youth will not need a season pass, nor will they pay a green fee. They will pay uh, a cart rental if they choose to use one. Young adults would be anybody from 21 to 25, which is kind of our, our old college classification. So they would pay a reduced rate of 198.37 for the season. Uh, adults, uh, we tweaked everything up uh, 2% for CPI. Hey, Brian mm -hmm. and Zane. You guys on this, on season passes, <laughs> you still have youth 18 and under. And then you have young adults, 19 to 25. The, the new ones, it's, it's, yeah. Any other questions from the council? We've been over this several times and, uh, and, then, and then we got in front of, of us. The, the two discounts. We have one flat discount for any purchase, any uh, season passes purchased in November, December is 15% uh, reduction. And then aren't we going to allow um, tournament winners to buy a pass? Right. Zane's going to talk about that. Yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, ask the council if we could, uh, in the past we always used to allow our golfers to use their pro shop credit towards their season pass for the next year. Uh, we haven't done that in the past three to four years at, at the recommendation of our consultant. Uh, but we'd like to go back to that if we could because we've seen a decrease in the participation of our, our tournaments. And we think that might be one of the reasons why. So we think if we go back to that we can get our tournament participation back up there and at the same time maybe even sell more passes. So. So Zane, our strategy on this was try to get more of the younger folks out there golfing, get them interested in golfing, and groom that next generation. Exactly. Correct. Yep. One of the 
problems <clears throat> actually golf nat nationally is younger people aren't playing quite as much as they used to. So I think this is a good incentive to you know get them to come out. So and that's that's our goal is to try to you know grow the game. So and that's where it's at. <laughs> so very good. I have no issue with the uh, credit going to the next year's membership. Any of the council members do. I mean, it just it seems a very trivial item to go ahead and and approve. So I'd look for a motion to approve these rates. I'd make a motion to go ahead and approve the rates as presented. I'll second. second. Motion and a second. Bastion with the second. I was looking at him. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, thank one last thing. I just wanted to publicly thank Dana for being our latest uh, Granite Rock sponsor. So appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, you had a police report in your board packet. Anything else from our chief of police call? Okay. Uh, inspection department report was in your packet. Anything further from the council on that? Fire department report. New chief, Robert Dykstra, just newly elected. Th thank him for all of his service there. And then also lastly, we have a police chief job description and tentatively, tentative hiring schedule. I think Brian had it uh, condensed in there to try to get it done before the, the end of the year. It's, it's a pretty aggressive schedule. It gives us a little bit of leeway if we, if we run into some issues, but our target date is to hire sometime in January for a new chief. Um, take a look at that job description, primarily the second page. We're looking at qualifications. Uh, high school diploma or equivalent, a BABS is preferred in criminal justice. Ten years of experience as a police department with at least seven years in a supervisory capacity. Uh, certified in their current state for law enforcement and uh, you must be certified in the state of South Dakota within six months. Talking with the chief, we could up that to 12, which is kind of customary um, number instead of six. And then you have to have a valid driver's license. Very good. Uh, we'll see if we can stick to that time frame. I, hopefully we can to buy you a little time to shadow the current chief yep. on that position we but, uh, so we're, we're already advertising um, we've got a deadline for application set as November 30th we'll take that first week in December to review the applications and then start lining up uh, interviews we always have a conflict at the end of the year with holidays um, but we'll try to work through them where do we advertise our positions at I'm just curious the challengers the official <laughs> newspaper uh, the municipal league website the South Dakota municipal league website uh, League of Minnesota Cities, Iowa League of Cities, um, and I can't remember where we usually put them on a job. Bird Dog. Bird Dog. Um, it's a job website. Okay, thank you, Brian. Number nine, the Park and Recreation Committee report. Ms. Fish? If, if, if you're comfortable, or do you want to wait on the job description? Otherwise, a, a motion to approve. Oh, we need a motion on the job description? Yeah. Can I have that motion? Second. second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Parks. This is Fitch. Uh, just some highlights from our committee meeting from last week. So if you'll recall, um, we're doing a study on a splash pad to see if that might be something appropriate for Brandon. And uh, the company that is doing it for us are going to be visiting us on December 4th. So if anybody's interested, we will have them on site. We have applied for a land and water conservation grant. Tammy put that together, so we'll see where we get with that. That's for Stone Ridge Park to get our um, shelter and restrooms in Stone Ridge. Um, we are putting together an RFP for the Aspen Park plan. We need a plan now that we've acquired that new land. So our goal is to have that done by July of next year. And our, our big thing that we're going to be coming forward to you with is the ash tree bore strategy. Not quite there yet, but we will bring a proposal forward. We do have some money in the general part of the budget. It's not in the park budget. The general part of the budget for the ash tree. So we will bring that forward um, 
maybe next time. And then if you will see in your packet, we've got a facility scheduling module that Christina's acquired for us, and that's like to schedule the shelters just to make it a little bit easier. I think they can pay online, right, Christina? Um, so we think that'll be a nice function to add to our swim lessons. We had really good comments on the swimming lesson sign up online, correct? Okay. Um, and so you can see that on page 33, I would make a motion to approve that um, purchase of that facility scheduling software. Is there a second? Motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, purchasing an extra module, the facility scheduling module, uh, at a cost of approximately 2000 Christina, is that right? 2500 I guess I have one quick question on that. Is that the same company that we're currently getting it from on the pools stuff? Yes, yeah, it would be the same company just being added. Just a little plug-in piece to it? Okay, yep. thank you. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Splash Park proposal. The one in the council packet isn't correct. We tweaked a little bit of the language, which is why I printed it out and handed it to you before the meeting. Um, nothing major. It is with Councilman Hunsaker for $28,200. I would make a motion to approve that contract. We've talked about it before. Is there a second? Second. If I can ask a question of Barb or Brian, I know I'm probably losing it, but didn't we approve an RFP earlier on a splash park proposal? Yep, this is the contract for that proposal. Oh, that's what we had RFPs on? The yep. Okay. 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 Any other questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. That's it. That's it for parks. Thank you. Item number 10 on the agenda, the first item under the administration committee report is the fireworks discussion. Can you uh, have it? Go ahead. Council member Parsons would like to uh, uh, read a letter that he it sent out earlier, but uh, he would like to read it out loud right now, and I have given him permission to do that rather than in the public input portion of the meeting. Go ahead, Mr. Parsons. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my daughter, Brooke, came to me when we first started this discussion some months ago and asked if I cared that she spoke up about an accident that happened to her years ago. and. I said, fine, our, our family really hadn't talked about it, but I said, go ahead. Uh, her intent was to be here tonight. Work got in the way. My wife was going to fill in. She's home with the flu, so you're all stuck with me. So, <laughs> Here's Brooke's uh, uh, email. Dear Council, I'm writing you today with regards to the potential fireworks ban slash ordinance change that is currently being discussed. I know there was a committee formed to gather more information on the subject, and you've heard multiple stories and opinions from all sides of the debate. But I think the one viewpoint that hasn't been voiced yet is the viewpoint of someone who is severely injured from a firework accident. I'm not writing you to share any additional statistics or, persuade, or present a persuasive argument of any type, but I did want to at least share my story, my experience with fireworks, to give you one more piece of information whether deciding whether or not the fun and enjoyment can come from fireworks is really worth the risk. I was 10 and it was the summer before my fifth grade year. My family had never been big users of fireworks. Uh, we used smoke bombs, sparklers, bottle rockets were about the extent of what we usually let off. And this particular summer was no different. At the end of the night, we walked down the street to a neighbor's house to watch some of the bigger stuff with the rest of the neighborhood. Again, no different from summers prior. What was different this year, though, was one firework set up out in the street that happened to tip over as it was going off. Unfortunately, the sparks from that firework happened to land at my ankle and continue to ride up the back of my leg to my hip. This all happened in a split second, so by the time anyone even noticed what was going on, the damage was more than done. I was immediately rushed to the hospital, hospital which is a ride I have zero memory of because I was passed out from the pain. The next few hours and months, and are still mostly a blur, blur but a few moments still stick with me 20 years later. Number one was seeing my leg for the first time before getting my skin graft. The entire back of my right leg had basically been destroyed. 
I had second degree burns from my ankle to my knee, third degree burns from my knee to my hip. If you've ever seen a third degree burn before, just imagine anything burnt to a crisp, skin completely black, crispy for lack of a better description, and flaking off at the slightest touch. In addition to the appearance of the burn, I can also still remember the, remember the constant smell of burning flesh from the time the injury uh, came up, up until the skin graft was performed. Number two was hearing from the doctor how a skin graft would work. I'd already been told that the entire back of my right leg would likely be scarred for the rest of my life, and now I learned that the only way to heal the third degree burn is to take skin from the unburnt part of my right thigh and transplant that to the burnt section of the back of my leg, meaning that now almost my entire leg was going to be scarred for the rest of my life. It was a lot to deal with at age 10 and continued to be a lot to deal with through adolescence when body image is tough anyways. While the scarring has gotten easier to accept as the years have gone by, it's definitely still something I'm reminded of daily when I see my leg. And number three, the burn unit and getting staples removed. The basic skin graft procedure is transplanting healthy skin onto burnt skin and then stapling that healthy skin onto the burnt section until it fully heals and fuses into place. The graft is super sensitive until it has time to fully adhere to your skin, so I was completely bedridden with absolutely zero movement allowed. I was also kept in the burn unit for the first days while healing, which smells of burnt skin 24-7 and is a smell I doubt I'll ever forget. Once the graft is healed enough, they have to remove the staples, which may have been the single worst part of the entire experience that I can remember. I equate the staple size to what you'd find in a standard staple gun out in your garage, and the tool they remove them with is basically a giant staple remover. I had a graft area of skin covered in staples with zero medication to numb any pain, no one is allowed in the room besides you and the doctors and nurses because it's too painful of a procedure to watch. I remember screaming throughout the entire thing. There are numerous other pieces of this story I could tell or my family members could tell, so hopefully this can at least give you a little insight into what can happen. We weren't being reckless with fireworks. We were standing the appropriate distance away. We had adults lighting off the fireworks. We were in compliance with city ordinances. We did everything right that year, but there's no amount of precautions that, be can, that can be taken that will prevent a freak accident from happening and ultimately changing someone's entire life. While that may seem dramatic to some, I spent months that summer in and out of the hospital and surgery and getting treatment for my burn and later my graft and scar. After that, it was still months before I was able to have my leg unbandaged for any amount of time, and it was years before I wore a pair of shorts again because of having to deal with people staring at or asking about my scar just wasn't worth it. I'm still waiting for the amount of time to pass that makes any of these memories less vivid or makes it so that every time I smell a firework, I'm not immediately transported back to the burn unit, or if there'll ever be a day where I don't notice the giant scar still on my leg. I know the statistics have been brought up in past council meetings and people still seem to think it'll never happen to them or it's not as bad as it sounds or whatever else, but I'd like to think I'm a little bit of proof that it can happen to anyone, anywhere, and I can tell you with complete certainty that it's 100% worse than it sounds. So please, before you vote to keep fireworks legal, consider a situation where your child or another loved one has to go through what I went through. Take a minute to imagine the almost unbearable pain that they'd have to go through, not just that night, which is actually the easiest part, but for months afterwards as they struggle in the hospital, undergo a brutal surgery, and then a recovery process that I can say from experience really never ends. Thank you, Brooke Eggers, 900 South Dakota Avenue. Thank you, Chuck. As I said, it's a very emotional issue, and that uh, is the epitome of emotion as a father to reread that letter from our from his daughter, I, I uh, commend you for that. I think what we have here tonight is uh, a resolution, or a, what, do you, what do we call it, Brian, an ordinance? It's a draft ordinance. Draft ordinance that's in discussion form, and what we directed the administration, what I directed the administration to do last time, is to draft this ordinance, uh, basically mirroring Sioux Falls. And that is what is before you in the packet that was presented to you. In addition to that, there was another draft resolution presented by council member fish that uh as she's alluded to earlier that would uh be a little less constricting on the fireworks and uh i think it was pointed out what it would allow more items that were pointed out on the table so it was just a, uh, a resolution that was less restrictive than the uh sioux falls ordinance that we mirrored so I would uh, entertain any thoughts from the council people 
on, uh, as I said, the resolutions are in discussion form right now. They'll be brought back for a first reading and a second reading. Is that, I think at this point, we'd like, I'd like to see some consensus on which resolution we are going forward with. So, um, as I've, I've talked to all of you in various stages of this, the reason I proposed the compromise uh, resolution was because, as Kim had alluded to, we were we were over here last or this year and now we're swinging all the way over to the other end of the table and I'm not sure if that's just um, because we're just more concerned about it I, I just think it's such a, a broad swing and that's really my concern I really do not care about fireworks one way or the other we don't shoot them in our family so that is not my um, reason for being involved with this. But I felt like the residents that enjoy fireworks should have an opportunity to, to enjoy some of them. Now, I will say that I'm rather disappointed that for those that are interested in having fireworks, they're not here. And I did get one letter stay, saying he was in favor of us keeping some fireworks, but I, you know I don't see an outpouring of public support for it. So maybe I'm off off kilter on this, and most people don't really care. So if we decide to go with the number one, which is what Lisa has drafted, I will wholeheartedly follow that. I, I still believe that compromise is is available here to us, but. Um, you know, if if the public isn't clamoring for it, then uh, I guess we do what you folks think. Well, I have been teetering back and forth because, again, I don't do fireworks now, but when I had a younger family, we did. So I've been teetering back and forth with it, not really sure which way, because over my seven and a half years, we have talked about this quite a bit. The past council has actually wanted different things with it. They've, some have wanted total bans and some have wanted this, what we have now. But that letter from Chuck's daughter, Brooke, kind of put the finale on for me. So with that being said, I'm in favor of the resolution or ordinance that we have in front of us that Lisa did. I just wanted to add that I appreciate Barb coming up with a compromise. I think it's good that we can all come up with that. Um, ever since this happened to Brooke, I've been thinking about doing something. I was tentative about doing something when I got elected to the council, and then when she brought it up to me, I thought, okay, as a parent, this is what I'm going to do. So to nobody's surprise, I support what Lisa has drafted tonight. I think we have a moral obligation to protect our citizens, so I'll still stand on the ordinance as it's written with Sioux Falls with a zero tolerance. Oh, and I just want to add one more thing. I got like two calls from people who wanted us to keep it the way it is now, and one person was here, but I think they had left by now. Um, but the outpouring of people that don't or that want the ban way outweighed it for me than the people that didn't. So. I had the same statistics that Joe just reflected as far as people reaching out. And, you know, if, if there was a way to compromise that would work with police enforcement, it might be different. But again, you know, it was brought up, you're in the middle of the night. How is a police officer going to tell if it was a little bottle rocket or a little firecracker? I, I just don't see it as realistic to go that direction um, or safe. So I concur with what Brett said. We, we have an obligation to, to always choose safety when that's presented to us. So I would go with Lisa's ordinance. I would also just add one other thing, and I didn't realize this, but I mean, a organization can come forward and get a permit to have a fireworks display. We have, for example, Bethany Metals every year has come forward to get a permit to have somebody shoot off, and so you can still do that. Um, right. So I'll go last. Um, honestly, this is probably one of the, the bigger struggles that I have when it comes to topics uh, in this community sitting in this seat. So I've been very vocal on what my personal belief is. And my personal belief is that uh, based on my personal struggles with PTSD, that fireworks can be extremely damaging to our fellow veterans. Um, it can completely ruin their day, their week, their month. Uh, and some of us are fortunate enough to have a service dog that is trying to help us and it can ruin their day too. And um, 
it, it's tough. But in this seat, there is a, a piece of it that has to represent the community. And that's where I have spent the last several days going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth as to what does it mean to be a council member and how do you res represent the community. Um, so it was pointed out that there were a couple of polls done and that's great. I think it's good that we got feedback from the community. It's super easy to click a button on Facebook and say that you don't want anything to change. But what takes effort is residents that have reached out or called or, or met with us. That takes energy and that takes commitment. And just like the other council members have said, uh, the overwhelming piece of, of the pie there was residents that wanted change. Uh, they wanted it to be restrictive. Uh, I did not have very many uh, residents reach out and say, leave it alone, uh, whether it was email or message or, or call. Uh, I did have several reach out uh, and meet with me even to say that we needed change for very similar reasons to what uh, Chuck's daughter had. And I can tell you that from talking with several, several veterans that they want change as well. And I think that when it comes to compromise, there's one piece that we haven't discussed a lot of. Uh, I did have the opportunity to discuss with Brett and with Dana that the city should look at helping supplement or support a true fireworks show put on by the city. Um, one thing that I've learned from talking with other veterans and from my own personal experience is a controlled show is much easier for us to handle. It's something that we know what's going on. Recently, out at Hussett's Badlands, pick your name, it's in between, they put on a show without notice. It was a huge show, and that impacted a lot of people. It was very, very challenging for, for several people. Dogs were up in a rut. I'm sure Mr. Irby's dogs were enjoying the show just like they did at the 4th of July. Um, so the moral piece of this is, is realistically we have to do what the rest of the council members have said and that's to, to do a ban. Now I want to make sure that this sticks and I want to make sure that we do not continue to have issues like we did last year where residents just willy, were willing to pay the $100 fee. Several of the residents that I talked to thought of it as part of the fee of buying the fireworks. Uh, one thing that I noticed in the compromise ordinance uh, put forth by Councilman Fish was a much higher fee, a much higher uh, penalty of $500. It would be in my interest to see that uh, continue to grow. Uh, I also would like to see zero tolerance and I would like to see that published. Uh, some of the discussions early on with Mr. Irby were about the communication and the lack thereof. And I think that has to be a major focus. So for us to have a successful July 4th next year, uh, I would support a fireworks restrictions similar to Sioux Falls like the other council members would and I would also uh, request that we uh, increase the amount of the fine uh, to be a sizable fine in uh, the $500 range or we can discuss that but that has to go up. Thank you. I guess in my position I don't generally take uh, one side or the other but I have answered some publics, uh, some of the public that has responded to me personally, and I've answered them on my opinion on the fireworks issue, so I would like to just put that out there for all of the public and all of the council uh, from the get-go, and I, in my dealings of thinking about running for this position of mayor, I sat out in the audience where you people are, and I listened to this discussion for several months, I don't three, four, four, five, I'm not sure, but uh, my opinion from the from the start, and it has not changed, has been to mirror an ordinance like Sioux Falls's. I have yet to have a compelling argument from the public uh, through email or personal contact, and I've had several of those contacts through email, uh, wanting one side or the other, but I've not yet had a compelling argument to allow the fireworks a compelling argument that would make me change my mind on that. So I, I just wanted that to be put out there that I am also in favor of having an ordinance that is mirrors the city of Sioux Falls. So with that said, I think uh, we'll instruct the administration to bring back the ordinance uh, for a first reading next board meeting. 
the yep. ordinance that mirrors the city of Sioux Falls and uh, with the suggestion from council member Wakefield of a difference in the fine is there any conversation right now from the council on that or should we if I can just make a comment of what the chief said mayor the chief had said um, and he can clarify but um, the giving warnings the first go around really was ineffective so we drafted this so that there's a hundred dollar fine the first time it's not like the compromise here of we'll give you a warning um, and then Dana I know you had suggested to me doing a, a step up on the second time or the you know the third time but um, that was a count or a comment that you had as well and then we do have a cap with the misdemeanor charge but I don't think we're getting to that yet so okay thank you okay as far as uh, the zero tolerance um, I, I personally don't think that that should be part of the ordinance I think that that should be part of the direction or directive from the chief the city administrator and the council don't make it part of your ordinance once you make it part of your ordinance if uh, if an officer goes there and there is some reason not to issue a citation maybe give a warning because there are you have to leave a little bit of discretion there a little bit um, and then they don't issue a citation uh, they're in violation of the ordinance you know the only the only two laws that I can think of where it's a mandatory arrest in the state of South Dakota um, that'd be domestic abuse officer goes there sees evidence of domestic abuse it it isn't a uh, uh, could make an arrest will shall uh, is how it's stated the other one is a uh, violation of protection order if if a person is present at the time of protection order and uh, the officer is there he will make he or she will make an arrest at that time putting putting a mandatory arrest a mandatory citation on uh, uh, on a city ordinance like this I, I guess I would oppose that at the same time that's a directive that should come from from your chief city administrator the council they can all support that but don't uh, sure. my okay. advice is don't put that in the ordinance thank you so just to talk for a minute about the tiered rate option I, I know we had a discussion about this where if somebody was a repeat offender <laughs> the officer would have the ability to step up the charge to like a disorderly or disturbing the peace or were those the two options if there was a repeat fend offender there are, yeah if it, um, liken it to a house party you know you go to a house party and you tell them to turn down the stereo because they're waking up all the neighbors and as a, you as a go council, back. I don't think we can get into every scenario. There's yeah, yeah. You go back to your car. There's going to be 110 yeah. scenarios here. But, right. Uh, just, just to Mr. Wakefield's point right. about: Do we want a different fine, or do we want a step fine, or do I, we want a fine and then disorderly? I think that's a detail of the ordinance. We're we're here to pass an ordinance, and to get into the detail of that, I'm I'm not sure. I'm with the chief that that's the discretion of the police officers. That's that's there. The violation. We need to set the fine amount yeah, right. through our ordinance or a resolution. So we need to set an amount. Okay. Any further discussion on the fine amount? I would agree with you, Chief, because I think we had the same conversation for when we changed it last year that we don't want to put in there that because it's going to be up to the discretion of the officer. You know, we're going to give it to, but we also we're, want um, zero. We're, we got to go on the fine amount here, I think, is what we're. Do you, do you want to step up? You want a $100 fine? You want a $250? $250? I'd be fine with $250. Okay, we'll proceed with uh, the ordinance, Marion Sioux Falls, with a $250 fine yep is that the intent of all the council up here we got that going now yeah. and carry on with that okay that'll be brought back for first reading next time job description for the part-time office assistant as we've discussed we're looking at hiring a part-time office assistants in the office to basically handle filing phones etc 
uh, freeing up some some existing staff to do more of their job duties. You've got a job description shown on page 42 and 43. I guess I just have this kind of the same comments from Thursday night. I'm concerned with the rate of pay just being barely above minimum when we're looking for them to be educated and experienced. Um, and then I guess the other side to that, maybe this needs to go back to the personnel committee, but I'm just a little bit curious if there's been discussion about, so if, if we're taking 20 hours of work off of, of whoever, what, what's going to replace that? Can we start adding some things in that we've been tabling, be it, you know, social media interaction, et cetera. Because I've learned this lesson many times in, in my business, it's really easy just to absorb time or spread time out amongst more people. But there's also ways to be diligent and make sure that some goals get accomplished. So when it comes to this position, one of the questions that continues to come to, to my mind is, is we already have a part-time individual. Um, and that individual <clears throat> has been retired in the past and and I'm kind of curious why we wouldn't look at taking that part-time role adding this additional funding to make it into one full-time role uh, and, and really you know make that look like a different position uh, I don't know if Dennis would be willing to take on that full-time role it's my understanding that he's not but I would I would prefer to look at making that change and take this salary plus Dennis's current salary and make it into a, a bigger position. Two very different positions. Dennis handles primarily economic development and industrial development. This is a person to answer the phone and do filing. Two very, very different positions. One of your main intents, I think, uh, from previous conversation was to cover the hours be around the noon hour, 10 to 2, 10 to two. type hours. Uh, for the office staff well and our original intent for this was so because we have the segregation of duties right that's part of it and that's and that's part of it for taking some of that role off of Christina too so this person can take over that I think the social media part because I've asked about the social media part it's almost like we need somebody almost full-time for that I don't know we're integrated with some other positions within but I think for this job right now is the part-time over the lunch hour to help these guys out in the office and take some of that segregation of duty away from Christina. Would that also have uh, the role of customer service? I mean, I think to some degree that seems like a very wise decision for that part-time position to make sure that we continue to do the things that Tim says, right? Customer service and and I think we can continue to do a better job of that, but would that role be partly for that as well? Correct. Okay. So this has been discussed in the personnel committee? No. Are we looking for a motion? If the, if the job description is adequate, a motion to approve as far as the wages go, those are just suggested. We usually don't include those, but that's just a suggestion from HR. What we'd be looking at, uh, we would look at those as we go through the selection process. I would make a motion to table this until the uh, personnel committee can review. So how's the personnel just second. committee? Is there a second on the motion? Second. Discussion. Just curious, the personnel committee, how do you feel about it being basically kicked back to you? Well, I guess I mean, we're going to advertise the position. We have to figure out the wages. I don't think we can figure out the wages after we advertise the position. So that would be one piece of it. But then I, I still kind of go back to if we're freeing up 20 hours a week. To me, there's a little more discussion there. Um, and granted, we might be overworking some people some hours, but I don't know that it's 20 hours worth. So what are we getting in return from that? So a concern I would have is <clears throat> if we kick it back to the personnel committee, is it going to take another 
month or so to come back to us and then it just delays it that much more. Yeah. We can ask them to have it back to us at the next meeting. For the record, I did forward it on to the personnel committee, committee, which were Joe and Brett at the time, and they really had no comment. I did a little bit back and forth with Joe, but they really had no comment. I'm not in favor of tabling it. I'm in favor of getting this going, so I would not support the table. Is it um, possible to, I guess, do both? We approve it. Can it go back to the personnel committee for more discussion and come back to us the next time, or next time we meet to have a deadline on it? I'm looking for your opinion, Tim. Uh, okay. So. I guess I won't have a problem amending the motion to say that we're tabling it and it should be uh, on the agenda next mm -hmm. meeting. So the expectation is is that we would get a um, response from the personal committee on this uh, by the next meeting. So does that answer your question, Chuck? I'm not sure what answer you're looking for. Um, because like Christina said, she sent it to Brett and I. I had a couple of questions, she answered them. I asked about the social media. So I, I guess I'm not understanding what, you know, you're talking about the wage. I get that. <laughs> but she did a location and pay period in the low, medium, and high range. So if we start at the median range at 1195 you know, I mean, that's depending on, I guess, the qualifications, what they have. But I don't know what you're looking for because I'd say it's okay to go. So well, the question I'd have for Dan is say we go ahead and move forward tonight. Can the personnel committee still meet and find the answers that you were looking for and come back to us the next time? I think Dan has a, a, a valid point that if we are going to be shifting um, work workload around, how, how is that going to play out into the whole office staff rather than just add on another position? So I think that's a, that's a, good, a good question to raise, but it probably could be done while we're looking for someone. So the reason I'm tabling this is because I don't feel we have uh, enough justification in place to really decide this um, based on some of the discussions that I've had with Dana and concerns on what the give and takes are. So we're adding 20 hours a week uh, with this position and very specifically pulling uh, off of uh, individuals that are already in our, our payroll and the feedback isn't there on what the benefits are of the position so I'm not okay hiring this position at this point and that's where I'm headed with it yes we do just hold on here uh, I'm gonna make this comment um, we've seen it we've looked at it and so I am not in favor of tabling it, but there is a motion on the thing here. There is a job description that has been given to us in the past, and for our review, we're not moving mountains with this job description. That's a 20-hour-a-week position at uh, approximately $11, and I agree, Brian needs to have the leeway. to. It's a, it's a number that's there for guidance. Uh, it can be adjusted with the amount of experience if he f finds that nobody, none of the applicants are are uh, acceptable of whatever the, the dollar amount is, then he has to adjust that. Uh, with that set being said, there is a motion and a second on the, on the table, and I'm going to call the roll on that right now, Christina. Uh, the motion is to table the job description for the part-time office assistant and have the personnel committee review and bring back by the time the next meeting comes around, November 19th. Thank you. Nicole? Yes. Bastion? Nate. Clark? Aye. Fish? No. Hausman? No. Parsons? 
Mate. Wakefield? Aye. Two to four, two yay and four nays. So the motion fails two to four. We're back to the job description. I'll make a motion to approve the job description as written. Is there a second? Second, but also to Deanna's point and Tim's to look at those discussion items with the personnel committee in terms of the, the, the concerns that you have and then also bring that back to the council. Um, I would support that. Okay. That's not the original motion. For a part-time job. Let me handle this. We have a motion <laughs> and a second. To approve the job description as written by the administration right now. That's my motion, yes. I will add at the end of this vote, I will add on there that I would ask the administration to come back with a memo to the personnel committee what delineating what is going to be taken off the table of somebody else with this position and what's going to be added, you know, just some details of, of how it, I understand that bringing in a 20 hour a week position is not it's not easy to delineate a certain task that's going to be free up all this time and and nobody's going to have anything to do in city hall i get that but uh i would ask the administration to develop a memo to the personnel committee uh with those facts in there now i'm back to calling the motion that's on the on the table right now to approve the job description as written. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Christina, call the roll, please. Bastion? Aye. Clark? Aye. Fish? Aye. Hausman? Aye. Parsons? Aye. And Wakefield? Aye. Motion would pass five to one. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a resolution number 19-18 to move contingency funds for 2018 uh, line items that are approaching or are over budget, I assume? Correct, yes, they are um, either over budget or um, getting close to over budget um, and uh, with projected expenditures towards the end of the year. Um, those, will, those are legal. Um, we are already over budget, so I am saying we need to do a contingency transfer of 25,000. Insurance, 7,000. Um, we've just added some large items over the last few years and did a little bit of um, readjusting to departments and stuff to more match our insurance. And the bid and the tip is interest on the bonds, about 1,100 for both of those um, are bond um, renewed la late last year after the budget cycle. So that's what the reasons for those. So is that insurance, is that like property insurance? Correct. Okay. For the public's uh, interest, uh, contingency funds are put into the budget for the city for a purpose. It's a line item in the budget. At the end of the budget year, those funds are then shifted into specific line items that are uh, at or over budget so that they do not exceed those budget line items. So if there's $10,000 in the contingency fund and uh, finance office supplies is over by 5,000, they'll move 5,000 from the contingency fund into finance office supplies is what the purpose of this, this transaction here. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Brian, you want to say a few words about Badlands Speedway? Yeah, uh, had a meeting last Wednesday between an interested party in the Speedway as well as representatives from Minnehaha County. It was just an opening meeting. Um, I wouldn't say it was gauging interest, um, but just discussing possible ways um, that that racetrack could be sold. Um, both the county and myself were very upfront that we as the governmental units were not in a position to finance uh, the purchase. Um, the gentleman that's interested uh, has some good ideas. He would be interested in operating it, but he does not have the, the uh, backing to purchase it outright for the six million asking price. Uh, Nick Fosheim with Makita Lakita was there as well. Uh, he has reached out to representatives from CCOG to see if they could provide some assistance 
whether it be a business plan type uh, development that person could use. Um, so like I said, it was a very, very informal first meeting. Any questions from the council on Brian's meeting? As we discussed in our briefing meeting, I think it was the general concept of the council that uh, we make very clear that we're not in the business of running a racetrack as the city of Brandon. Yep. We're there as a facilitator. Correct. And a facilitator only. Our financial interest is not in purchasing a racetrack at this time. Okay, moving forward. Uh, the development committee, Mr. Parsons. Um, in your packet, you've got some comparisons that we did at our last uh, development committee. There was concern among the committee just where we stood on building permit fees and platting fees. And with Tammy and Brian's help, we put together these charts, went over it line item by line item. I think it uh, answered a lot of questions. And I think the group came away thinking that we were um, fair, knowing that we have to have some of these fees to pay for things that we do. The one question that came out that I think we're going to try to answer in the upcoming months as we meet is um, that SDC charge. So I've noted that. <laughs> if Brian can notate that whenever we get around to discussing that. That was one item that this group asked us to take a look at. Um, otherwise, you can look on, it's page 139 of your packet. I did a summary of the meeting. Can you go more in depth on what you're talking about with the SDCs? The committee just asked that uh, the council take a look at if those could be decreased, Tim. That was it. That was their question. Could they be look at decreasing? So the, the SDC is a fixed price to, that we pay to Sioux Falls per connection, correct, Brian? Correct. So the, the They just asked the question. Yep. So the development, the, the committee members are asking if the city would supplement that further. I would add that I had the uh, opportunity to s sit on that committee with Mr. Parsons long before I became in, came into this position. It was very beneficial to me. One of the things that came out of that committee, I think for my own purpose, was that uh, I had a perception from my builder friends that uh, brand and building fees were, were too high and we were causing a problem with our building people and I found out through this committee meeting that they are not too high. It's just a, it's a shell game of how develop fees, developer fees versus building permits versus platting fees. It, when you get down to the bottom line, we're far below the city of Sioux Falls in our fees and very comparable to a lot of other cities in our fees. So it was a learning experience for me and I appreciate the, the time and effort put forward on that. And uh, I think Mr. Parsons is not the committee is not deceased by any means. He's just recessing it for a while after, uh, with the holidays coming up, and uh, he will get together again after the first of the year and look to see if there's any issues. It was very beneficial to have the people in that room, the developers, the builders, the guys that are in the trenches. And we'll continue that uh, committee. Thank you, Chuck. Yep, thanks. Uh, social media policy. That's, go ahead. I will have a draft for you at the next council meeting. Okay, wage and study, That's wage been, and benefit study. We've been uh, looking at that, had a chance to, an opportunity to look at that at our, at our work session. Probably not in, in as much depth as we wanted to, but uh, ran out of time. Fair? Yep, it's been referred to the personnel committee. Um, and I need the personnel committee to give me some dates and times that they can meet. You guys get with Brian then uh, and uh, go from there with that. Uh, appoint Dana Clark to the personnel committee. This is uh, Joe and Brett are on the, the representatives from the council on the personnel committee right now. Dana has invested a lot of time and effort into the wage and study and benefit study. We felt it appropriate that she be included in that committee. Any opposition from the council on that? I wouldn't think nope. so. Uh, motion. I'll make a motion. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor of appointing Dana Clark to the personnel committee, in addition to Mrs. Hausman and Mr. Bastian. 
Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, the last item under administration report is the council slash mayor rules and code of conduct. Code We've of talked conduct. about having a work session on these. Um, I will send out a doodle poll tomorrow to see when everybody is available. Yep, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little tool that you can mark what days and times you're available to meet. I'd like to get through this issue, folks, so make every effort we can to get get a time to get a work session in and uh, and get this hashed out. Thank you. Next, number 11 on the agenda, street committee report. Maintenance work report for your review. Raleigh, anything to add? Thank you. Safety on Holly crosswalks. Tammy. Yes, so we had three requests from Riley. Um, number one, I think, is pretty much being taken care of. Number two is the one that I'd really like to visit. Um, they asked if we could change the gels and the crosswalk lights from yellow to red. Um, Federal Highway has rules against this. We cannot change those lights to red. Um, what I am proposing is that we take a look at the whole school zone. All the signs within that have, um, they're probably a little bit outdated at the moment. Federal Highway in the last couple years has uh, updated some of their standards as far as reflectivity and uh, school zone signs are now the yellow, the yellow greenish signs are just a little bit different than your typical yellow signs. Um, along with that, with the crosswalk in there, we have one of those push button flashing lights. And this light flashes pretty slow and the way that most communities replace these with is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. And Federal Highway has really gone back and forth on whether or not they approve this or not. Um, a couple years ago, they did not approve it. As of March 2019 or 2018, they wrote an addendum to the MUTCD stating that they are approving it now. So I did do some price checking on that. They cost the new wear from about 10 to 15,000 a piece. So they're pretty spendy signs. Um, I don't know if we want to go down that route and try to replace some of those flashing lights. The other thing that has been talked about is changing those systems to Hawk systems. There are none of them in the state of South Dakota right now, so we would kind of be the guinea pigs on trying them out. Um, if we did put them in, they are quite a bit more expensive, probably in that thirty to 50000 range. And that would take a lot more education of the public just on how to use them because they have yellow lights, red lights, flashing lights, solid lights. Um, that being said, it is along Holly. We have three crosswalks along Holly that probably do warrant some type of flashing sign. Um, along Rice Street, the ADT, the average daily traffic there is right about 10,000. So. That street right now has been projected to be a four lane road and I know that Holly, our section there, is probably never going to be four lanes, but it is a busy road. So I can look into doing, like changing out the signs there and working with Raleigh on that. I guess I need a little bit more direction from council on how far you want me to take it. I mean like, do you have any picture? I, I, I'm this, not the Hawk system, but the other sign. What What's going to be the advantage to that? Just the color, or it's, it's a stationary sign? It is. It still flashes yellow, and if you, if you go to Sioux Falls and look at any of their school zones, that's what they have at their crosswalks. Um, that What they do is they just they flash very fast, and so they kind of grab your attention, much like a police light. We can't zip ours up. I don't think so. I think we've been looking at that a little bit. And how many of these signs would we, would we need? Well, we should probably should have one on six, on fourth, fourth in Holly. But we could possibly put in three. Three would be ideal. Can we have YouTube videos of each of these signs sent to us with the projected cost of each sign so we can kind of sure. get a better understanding of what that sign would look like and what the cost might be? Sure. Then reach out to our friendly neighbors and ask them what they pay and see if we can get on their bid. That'd be awesome, if you haven't already. Sure, I can do that. 
And we also talked about more education in, in the elementary schools and the middle school too. So to try to get that in there too, because of the crosswalk is actually walking, right? And a lot of them don't. So I think more education for that would be good too. I think Riley's been working on a PowerPoint for that. Is that? Oh, good. <laughs> Which so I'm happy to help out with if you need some. So if we look at these YouTube videos, can we do that at the next meeting so maybe we can decide? Sure. Do we have the money for them? Maybe the signs. I think we have a little bit of budget money for the signs yet. No? Okay. So maybe I can for, bring that cost estimate Yeah, too. I think you better bring the cost estimate and what we got available and go from there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else on cross crosswalk issue? All right, thank you. Uh, the next item on the list is that we need to approve a grant for the city transit system, operation of the city transit system. This is the 5311 grant funds for operation and maintenance of the transit system. We applied for, I think, 79,000 roughly. Uh, the state granted us 59,523. Need a motion. Can I make a motion to approve? Second. Motion and second. All those in favor of approving this grant for the city transit system signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Holly Boulevard 2018 Northwest Permit Application Proposal and Contract. This is a contract with uh, Clark Engineering to fill out the application for the nationwide permit. This is for the Holly Project. We are, we are winding that road um, to four lanes, which will be disturbing about half an acre of wetlands. Motion to approve the... So moved. Second. Motion and a second, Parsons and Hausman. Any discussion? This is to mitigate the wetlands? Okay. For those that don't know, when the project involves a wetlands area, we have to uh, mitigate that. And what happens is we go and purchase some other land that uh, becomes wetlands that's already a wetlands or something like that. They have a bank of wetlands. So we give up our wetlands or we get to use our wetlands, but we have to replace that with wetlands somewhere else. So that's the mitigation of the wetlands proposal. Okay, anything else? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Curry. Grant application for a new transit bus. This was submitted by ICAP. Uh, the oldest bus that we have is one of our original ones with about 200,000 miles on it. They submitted an app from to the state. The state will fund 80% of the purchase of a new bus. So the grant award would be 55,000. Our share would be somewhere between 15 and 20. Do we need a new bus? Talking with ICAP, the, the oldest bus that we use as a backup with 200 plus thousand miles on it is, is reaching the end of its useful life. That was ICAP's recommendation. Okay. Do I have a motion? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the grant application for a new transit bus signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Water and sewer committee reports. 12A. Resolution 20-18, setting wastewater rates for 2019 to, through 2022. You have two draft resolutions in your packet. The first one, it's titled Revised Three-Year 20%. That shows the correct numbers for the monthly base fee. Uh, if we were to increase rates 20% for the next three years, the next one is if you were to increase rates 15% for the next four years on page 110. I'll introduce the conversation on this uh, topic. We've had a lot of discussion over the months and years on sewer and water rates. 
what we're doing with this resolution is increasing. I've asked the council to consider increasing the water rates to 15% over the four year period rather than the 20% over three year period. We have uh, several projects on the books that we're trying to get uh, accomplished. They all take, they all take money. Uh, we can't get these uh, wastewater and, and uh, all these projects that we're talking about Major one is the Holly or the drainage. West side interceptor, I think, is what we're Trunk sewer is what we're calling it. West side trunk sewer, yes. Uh, so an increase is probably very valid. Nobody likes an increase in their in their uh, utility rates. I understand that, but uh, it's something that we have analyzed and looked at for a long time, and we're posed with this increase. And nobody on this council likes it. I don't think, but it's a necessary evil. I think the residents of Brandon want progression. They want these projects to be completed. And along with that comes an increase in rates. That's just the bottom line. I mean, I guess there are alternatives that we could take monies away from something else and put it towards these items. But it's a give and take, folks. Everybody wants 100 things. And there's only room to fund 80 of those things. So if we take out part of those 80 things that we have funded already, you're going to have a, an issue there too. So I think this is a valid uh, proposal that we, has been presented to us by the administration, and and uh, I would seek any other input from the council. Um, I would make a motion that we go with the 15% for four years. I'll second that. Any further discussion? In regard to the percent, is it towards the base charge, surcharge, or the per thousand charge, just for my clarification? It's, it's for the volume charge and the monthly base fee. The surcharge is set with our agreement with the state for financing of the Big Sioux lift station. So that doesn't change. So it would be you'd add the, the, the per thousand charge plus the base charge, and then whatever that would be would be for 15% of above that or yep. tacked on to yeah, that. Yeah, we added 15% to the minimum base fee and then 15% to the volume charge. Okay. So I'm a, a numbers guy. It's part of where my head is, and, and being able to visualize um, really is, is key. So I did a graph uh, here for the council. Uh, 5,000 gallons, 6,000 gallons, and 7,000 gallons, just to give some kind of variability here uh, so we can see where the rates have been and where they're headed. Um, when it comes to raising the rates, uh, Mayor Lumberg said it very, very well that it's, it's a necessary evil based on the projects that we have. Um, so I, I have a few points I'd like to, to bring up. Number one, uh, this resolution will include the forecasted future increase. <laughs> all the way through 2022. Uh, that's in our intent to show the residents what's coming, not just change it this year, we change it next year. So, so it's a process. It's something that we're working towards. Uh, Lisa, the question I have for you is, with this resolution, should something change two years from now when we need to either not do as big of a rate change? Is it? Are we able to modify this resolution? You were able to modify it. We don't need Lisa for that. I will say we will be able to modify this resolution. <laughs> yep. um, so that's good to know. Um, one of the, the, the questions that I have when, when looking at this, and you know, we've had some some working sessions, but you know, there there's projects in in this forecast uh, that really are specific to Brandon's growth and really help with. Um, you know, the specific development of Brandon. And these rates are helping pay for that growth. And some of the questions that I've, I've received, and honestly some of the questions that I have is, are we adequately recouping cost from the developments through uh, service, the service connect fees, uh, for example, we're supplementing with taxpayer dollars uh, the growth of developments. Also, uh, we're continuing to uh, look at cost recoveries because we do some of that, but are we doing enough? Uh, in Sioux Falls, cost recoveries are much higher than what they are here in Brandon. And when you look at some of these projects, uh, very specifically the uh, roughly million dollars on the east side of town by Bethany Meadows, uh, that project is something that impacts new lots, new development. And, and I have a hard time having that hit the rates when it's so specific to uh, development and growth uh, for those new residents, not specifically for the current residents. So I'd like to see those projects kind of split up a little bit too. These are the projects that really are to the race and maintaining, and these are the 
projects that are more specific to, to the growth and should be uh, paid for by the development side, not necessarily the rates. Um, another prime example, the, the main line that runs from the sewer pump station to Aspen, um, that, that is tied to growth. Um, and are the developers paying their fair share or is the burden solely uh, hitting uh, the residents? And I'd like to see that broken out more. I'd like to have discussions on that so that we can make sure that that share is, is there um, because it's, it's important that, it, that it's fair. Oh shoot, I didn't have my mic on for any of that. I apologize. Mine was on, I probably picked up. Brian, can you speak to what Mr. Wakefield uh, addressed on the east side? Isn't that uh, proposed as a cost recovery? Yeah, the, the sewer main that we've talked about running up through, up to Redwood. Right, from, right. From In the approximately Bethany. Um, we have talked about that as, as some type of cost recovery. Uh, at some point in time and and that is uh, speaks to your point of new development and that is something that can be pinpointed to a new development uh, that is not existing the, some of the problem comes Mr. Wakefield you know it's hard to you can't do a cost recovery on an existing development those guys that are already halfway into the development you can't, they can't get back or they can't recharge their their customers for for an issue, so it uh, we have to do that through this this avenue. No, I, um, no, we got it. Um, I, I understand that. I want to look forward, um, you know, moving forward, especially with this sewer trunk main on the east side. If it's a million dollars, how do we make sure that we're recovering that million dollars on the development side? There are going to be other developments, not necessarily just the one that would be north of the future school, but that is going to help other developments. So how do we make sure we draw a map and we say the forecasted return is to try and get a million dollars? That's That's what my goal is is yes, we're cash fronting this, and yes, the city is paying for this, but in the future, uh, there's just not enough definition on, uh, from my point of view is, you know, we're looking forward to doing that in the future, maybe kind of, yes, I don't know. Um, that that just is a struggle for me. Um, if we're going to invest a million dollars for development, like you said, Mr. Mayor, if the developments aren't there, we need to let them know that that's coming. And that's what Sioux Falls does very specifically on their cost recovery map. Um, and I've um, brought that up in the past. Tammy, do you have a projection of what that uh, expenditure and what the cost recovery would uh, entail on the number of acres that are out there? I don't, not in front of me. Okay, um, be, I think it would be something that we could develop and we see We could what, develop that pretty easily. I mean, we've got to set that fee anyhow and, and right. uh, it's at that time that fee will be set. And I would also like to add that none of the cost recovery was included in any of the financial projections right. that, that were that's... presented to the council. So that's a bonus, uh, a potential bonus of money coming back towards the city. Other thoughts? I had a resident reach out today that I called and the her question was, is could we use the state revolving fund and loan out? We had a chance to just visit with it. Brian just very briefly with that. Uh, can you kind of explain that process and whether that would make sense for us? And then my second question, or actually I have two additional. Number one is we have a force main extension for approximately $4 million. My, it's a redundancy if I understand that to be correct. And so is that something that we're needing and then also have we communicated with Sioux Falls yet in terms of whether they're going to accept that additional sewage if if we get to that point whatever mark that might be and then the third question is is these are projected estimates um, which kind of concern me a little bit ha, do we even have a consideration for uh, reaching out to those firms that might be doing these projects and getting a, a little bit firmer projection costs so that we can get a, maybe a little bit better understanding of what the actual percentage may be, because I think if my math serves me correctly, it's 13.5 or so million dollars in projects, and I think that's about nine projects. If my math is correct, it may not be correct, but that's another consideration I have is I'm a little bit concerned that if it's just an estimate based on lineal foot or whatever, 
uh, is that estimate high or low? So that's just some concerns that I have. As far as the revolving loan fund, we do include some of the projects on our list uh, receiving financing from the revolving loan fund from the state. They offer three different terms, 10, 20, and 30 years. Uh, I think the rates are two, two and a quarter, and two and a half percent, respectively. Um, we did include some private financing for some of these projects. Uh, private financing is a little more flexible than the revolving loan fund, but if the, if the council wanted to, we could certainly take a look at utilizing the revolving loan for the vast, vast majority of the projects. Um, it's just that if, if you remember the discussions during the work session, we, we were somewhat hesitant to go past the 15 years on some of those projects. Um, you know, once you start getting out 30 years, it's like buying a car. We can go out and get revolving loan fund at 30 years at 2.5%. It's certainly going to decrease our annual payment. Um, but some of, the, some of that infrastructure might wear out by the time we pay off the loan. So we can certainly sit down and take a look at the council again with those rates and go through and, and play with the numbers um, and show what impact those different scenarios would have individually on, on the projects and, and uh, where we would sit with the rates if you wanted to. I think the key point there is we are accessing the revolving loan yep. funds to the degree that we feel appropriate right now. Correct. And uh, we could maybe expand that a little bit, but you're right, it comes down to the payback and the number of years and yep. uh, all those other issues. And as I emailed one of the council members today, uh, on the projections and stuff, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, the interest rate environment is just one thing that can, when you, folks, when you're talking about $30 million, 10, 20 basis points in the interest rate has a huge effect on on uh, uh, the total cost of these projects, so it's a very tough thing to project. I think uh, the estimates on the projects, I think, are is probably as good as we can get at this point. Uh, I would suspect that they would be on the high side, or I if there were any uh, error, most of the time engineers are cautious on the high side, but uh, that's a, a generalization that engineers probably wouldn't like to to hear from from me but uh, that's just been, been my history yep and then as far as, far as the force main to Sioux Falls I'll let John or Tammy take that one but there is some redundancy in the system and then also if if we follow our projections for population growth um, eventually we will uh, reach capacity in our existing force main so that's the other factor in there, it's not just for redundancy; it's for increased capacity for our growth. Just to add to that, um, I don't. I haven't seen that there's been a report or anything saying how what the capacity is right now. Um, that's not to say that there isn't something out there. I'm sure it's been projected. Um, we can definitely start those talks with the city of Sioux Falls and try to work out some of those details. Um, the cost estimates. Yes, they're high. They should be for budgeting purposes. The last thing we want to do is throw a number out there, budget this much amount for it, and then not be able to complete the project halfway through because we ran out of money. So we could definitely get more cost estimates, and we could try to firm up some of those costs. But at this point, yes, they're high. One thing I would like to see us do whatever route we go is to put out some public information and give some examples, because I, I think there's a lot of confusion. Like I, I did the math on my own rates and worked with Christina to get some ideas on some additional usage rates, and, and a lot of the the numbers that were ran were a lot less than, than what I thought they were gonna be, and the citizen that reached out suggested that we, we get some of that data out there. Like, for example, somebody using 3,000 gallons, we're talking $5.46. You know, get them that information in addition to a percentage, do some more community education. Um, the other thing I guess I would I would be interested to know, and I don't think we have this number right now, but what is the average Brandon user using for sewage? I am ready to call the question. Okay, any other comments from the council? Is there such a thing as a, just, 
taking off on your average uh, sewer use, is that something that can be quantified? We can take a look at it. Um, probably be more beneficial for residential <coughs> consumers. Uh, commercial and industrial is going to be all over the board. So we'll see if we can come up with a number for residential. Okay. I just... Right, right. There's, it's a little tougher to quantify that, I would imagine. Okay, with that being said, uh, I have a motion and a second on the floor. I'd like to have Christina call the roll on this. Motion is to increase the waste uh, sewer rates 15% over the next four years. Okay. Bastion? Aye. Clark? Aye. Fish? Aye. Hausman? Aye. Parsons? Aye. Wakefield? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number B is Bethany Meadows BMP proposal and contract. This is the BMP or detention pond that's east of town um, over by Bethany Meadows. There's been quite a bit of talk in the past about doing a small maintenance project out there. To me, I feel like we could go in there and clean it out. That does need to be done. Um, but I would really like to take a step back and look at this more big picture. This was built in 2011 and we haven't done any maintenance work out there since. This is a big piece of infrastructure for us and we should treat it just like we treat a lift station or a booster station. It needs maintenance on a regular basis. Um, we need to constantly be reevaluating it. Um, since this has been built, there has been a large development in there. And the last thing that I want to do is clean it out just to have the same problem there again. Um, this proposal is to survey it, to look at the old plan, to compare it to what's out there now, to see how much it's overgrown, how much it can actually handle, and at what rate it can handle. There was a little bit of localized flooding um, a couple months ago with a heavy rainfall, which is expected. Um, we need to be a little bit more diligent on erosion control and whatnot out there. But I would still like to take a closer look at that low point that's actually uh, draining into this BMP. And another big factor in this is water quality. When we hit that population of 10,000 people, we are held to different standards. And we need to be a lot more conscious about how that water gets there, what kind of quality is in it, and how and what the quality is when it uh, is leaving that BMP. So this contract is for $40,484.20. I assume since this is in my backyard, there's no impact on me voting or anything as early, so. No, I mean, it, it's not Just want to make sure. Yeah, your okay. personal I'll, property. I'll make a motion to approve this. Second. Any discussion? I think it's worthwhile to do, so thank you. All those in favor of approving the contract for 40000 approximately 40400 to review the Bethany Meadows BMP uh, site for possible upgrades and cleaning up, so on and so forth. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Water treatment, or water tower plans and specification review proposal and contract. This is a contract with DGR and it's not for design, it's not for analysis, it is strictly to look over the design plan set and specs just to cover our basis, we're going to spend anywhere from about $9.7 million on our water towers. And this is just uh, another pair of eyes on the set of plans. How much? What's the contract for? This is the water tower, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's for the BMP. This, this contract is hourly, not to exceed. It runs from 10000 to 15000 Okay. I'll make a motion we approve. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, does this include hydraulic modeling to ensure no. elevations are correct or anything? No, like it that? does not. 
Hydraulic modeling would probably take quite a bit more time. We have a lot of the GIS data and we have an AutoCAD map, so compiling it's not so hard, but when you're looking at putting together a water model, the hardest part is calibrating it. So we probably need some field work done. Um, the Public Works guys do their own pressure testing and they have a lot of that data. Um, we can go through some of that and try to put it together, but I, I don't think we have time to do that and bid the water towers. Doing what's right takes time. And if it's something that should be done, then it's better to do the delay instead of have a mistake. Is there any, do you have anything that would lead you believe that we should do a double check on elevations or anything other than that? Because this is a huge purchase for the city. And I'm very, very hesitant to not do a complete review if we're gonna do it. This seems like we're just going part of the way. I think within time after this is bid that we should have a water model. Therefore, that I as city staff, it's the city engineer understands our water looping system. There's a lot going on. There's different, um, there's different sections of town on different pressures. Once we put those water towers up, um, there are, I have some concerns on pressures in different parts of town. I think we have that pretty well figured out. We're keeping that existing tower to uh, provide those lower pressures to the older part of town, which is also why we're replacing some of the infrastructure in the core. So I really don't feel like we need to double check the water model right now. We know that we need the water towers because we need the elevated water storage. That part's not gonna go away. Um, as far as when we fill them up and how we're going to circulate that much water in the short term, yes, we're going to need a water model and we're going to need to understand that more. So right now I think we need to stick with reviewing the plans and then after that it's going to be Raleigh and the Public Works guys and I sitting down and having some work sessions and understanding our system. Is the key in getting this done right now is we want to get it out for bid, right? Because that's what slowed us down last year. Okay. okay. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Call the roll, Christine. No? Sorry. That's fine. Bastion? Aye. Clark? Aye. Fish? Aye. Hausman? Aye. Parsons? Aye. Wakefield? Aye. Okay, motion carries 5 1. <laughs> Approval for bids on well number 8 to be open on December 5th, 2018, and to review the a review of the gamma logs. I'm going to hand this one over to John Brown to talk about the gamma log results. Um, there's going to be a couple different alternatives on how we're going to bid this and go through that, so I'm going to have him explain that to you. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, John Brown with Stockwell Engineers. We've uh, prepared a design memo for you all uh, to, to, I guess, to, for take-home reading, but I'll kind of summarize uh, why we're doing well number eight. Well number eight is a replacement of well number six. Uh, well six was... Uh, was determined that we wanted to, to uh, upgrade that uh, so that we had a, a new well in the, in the area so we could provide more water for our city. As, a, as the project understanding, what you see at the top of our memo, it just really talks through that process and where we came from and where we're going. As far as the 2007, we did bid this well screen. This is a two-part project. We're going to we're going to bid the well screen now if you approve this tonight. And then there will be a later bid package that will come forward with the actual pump and the pump house and transmission line from that location to the water treatment facility. So this is the first of two parts to this project. Uh, the data summary that, you, uh, that we've kind of reviewed in, in the past, so we've already done a test well to determine what different layers of sand and gravel that we have down through the, 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 uh, the uh, soils. 
And so basically what we've been able to determine is where do we need our screens? So then we also did a gamma log, which is what is in question here and what uh, we've wanted, uh, I guess you've asked us to look at more detail on. So that gamma log has been reviewed by us, provided to us by a, a, a separate individual company that, uh, that evaluated the existing uh, test well. And basically what you have is three different example or three different options to consider. The one is uh, to install a shortened well screen to minimize the radiology contaminants. And the second is to install a full well screen uh, to maximize the yield. And the third is to do a combination of those. So what we bid in the, the original uh, bid package was actually number two, what was already bid. Uh, option number one that you see there, install basically the design alternatives was to install a shortened well screen to minimize the, the contaminants and basically based on our the the gamma log that you see down at the lower end of that uh, well basically we had some some I guess feedback from the from the test that would actually result in a shortened well screen so when we shorten that well screen we basically wouldn't be in a, in a sense trying to pull water from that area so uh, to try to put that in layman's terms, basically what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of water that we'd be pulling from those higher levels of, call it radioactive area. And so by doing that, what we would do is actually shorten the well so we'd increase um, our quality of water, but we'd reduce the quantity of water. So the uh, current well number six currently exceeds what the EPA standards are for radium. So we, we know that well actually runs all the way down to the to quartzite, Sioux quartzite, with that screen. This, this new screen, what you would have in well number eight, would have the option to do a deep well like we have already for well six, which would be a replacement of well six, which was our initial intent or to put a shortened well screen, so actually shorten up that well screen so we don't run all the way to the bottom. And so then as a result of that, we would reduce the amount of quantity of water that we would have, but potentially increase the quality of that water. There's no guarantee that you're gonna increase that quality and there's no guarantee that you won't eventually get that radio, that radium still coming into the, to the well itself and over time. So what we've had for you, uh, I guess what, what we've been asked to do is actually take this back to the Water Development Committee and ask for their input. So this uh, design memo and meeting notes from our meetings with the city staff uh, will be presented to the, to the Water Development Committee for their uh, consideration. Uh, we also uh, have already uh, put together the bid package and are waiting uh, to go out for uh, advertisement and bid that project. The bid dates currently, uh, as stated in the agenda, say December 5th, well actually that doesn't work because the D Water Development Committee will not be meeting until November 13th. So uh, because of that, we want a chance or an opportunity to make adjustments to that bid package after the Water Development Committee has made a recommendation to you. So as a result of that, that would push our bid date back and so I think uh, Tammy could actually elaborate on that a little bit if she'd like. Just that we're gonna plan to bid this on uh, December 19th. And it takes about three weeks in advance of that because we need to advertise a couple of weeks. Council all right with uh, passing it through the Water Development Committee. It's gonna extend the time frame here a few weeks, but uh, not insurmountable. And their recommendation will be to you which direction to go on this one, two or three is your assumption? I would assume that. I would think they'd bring it back to you as a recommendation to the City Council to have us that's change what, or move forward. That's what the administration wants to uh, yes. get out of this whole process? Okay. Can I have a motion to, uh, 
I think to approve the design memo. Or do I need? I don't need a think motion? you need a motion. Brian. No. Uh, that was just an explanation of the of the process. Okay. At this point in time. So they'll take the design memo to the water development committee, ask for a recommendation. You guys will bring it back, and uh, we'll get on the process. Grease trap inspection program. Oh wait! Don't skip number or letter E. Water treatment. Am I missing something? Oh. I'm checking them off too fast here. <laughs> <laughs> Approval to call for bids in the water treatment filter media replacement. Uh, we're just replacing the media, um, the green sand in our existing water treatment plant. We're changing that to IMAR. So we have plans set, everything put together. We just are going to go to bid. Um, this Wednesday we'll advertise, next Wednesday we'll advertise, and then two weeks after that we'll go to bid. Estimated cost of around 150,000. I had written in my notes. Yeah, we're advertising it as 121. 121,000. Do I need a motion, Brian? Yes, I'd like the motion to a second. Mo <laughs> motion and a second to approve the call for bids on the water treatment filter media replacement, opening on November 28th. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Grease trap inspection program now. Here he comes. Here he comes. Raleigh. Uh, right now, there's been no change. We did have our first meeting uh, October 24th, I believe it was. Um, didn't have a lot of people show up for it. I think we had five people total. So I'm going to try and have another one after the first of the year and kind of design this one around the implementation of it, what we're going to be looking at putting into the plan. So. That's about as far as I've gotten with it, so. Sounds good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Raleigh. Uh, that appears to be the end of our agenda. I would seek a motion to go into executive session for personnel and legal matters. Raleigh, Mayor, I do have one other thing to add. I'm sorry. Um, kind of goes back to the crosswalk safety. <clears throat> what uh, Tammy had mentioned about the RRB lights that are at the crosswalks. Right. Part of the reason that the uh, Federal Highway Commission is jumping back and forth with these lights being they flash at such a fast rate, they've found people to have seizures due to that. That's why they're jumping back and forth because there's some mm. studies that are being done on that now. Um, so that's why they've jumped back and forth. Good. Thank you. We're... Okay, I need a motion to go into executive session for personnel and legal. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you.